touchdown has now been canceled due to our, uh, our coronavirus. So you should all feel a terrible weight of guilt. <laughs> Pleasure it is to be here. It's a big group. It's a broad room. I feel like I need to constantly do the wave as I'm looking around. If I'm not paying you enough attention, move or something occasionally. But I, um, this is my style. My style is that I want interaction. So if you've got a thought or a comment, do not be shy. You're probably noticing that the title of what I have up here is a little different than what went out. Don't be alarmed, and uh, don't be alarmed by saying from the Middle Ages to the 19th century. We're not going to be here for six hours, talking about 500 years of, uh, of history. But the more I was researching and preparing for this topic, the more I felt like we needed to go broad before we went deep. Uh, who can tell me what this building is, where it is? Paris Opera House. Okay. Any other names you know what goes by? Uh, Palais. Palais. Anybody want to fill in the blank there? Where the Palais Garnier, after Charles Garnier, the architect who did it. Who, by a show of hands, has been to the Paris Opera House? Okay. How many of you keep your hands raised? Keep your hands raised if you went to a performance of an opera or ballet. How many? So, how many of you went to the auditorium? Okay, so you went to the auditorium. Okay, we're going to try and recreate some of this. But as you know, reproducing on that foot is a big screen. What is that? Eight foot by 12 foot screen. Even on a screen that size, trying to reproduce the experience of being in a building that's this monumental is going to be very, very difficult. We're going to try. It, is, it was considered at the time it was built. It was started about 1863, built until 1875. Um, it was considered one of the great wonders of, of Europe at the time it was done for aesthetic and for engineering reasons. But it was also a very controversial building. It continues to be one. And we're going to kind of start at the end of our journey and then work our way back to it. I want to start with the Garnier, the Palais Garnier, the Garnier Opera House, the Paris Opera, it goes by all of these names. There's just one. Um, and we're going to first look at the building itself and then back off entirely and lead our way up through the training that led to the arsenal of skills that made it possible. So, in the 1850s, uh, Napoleon III, Napoleon III, who is the nephew of Napoleon, assumes power in France. He becomes a quasi-dictator. With those dictatorial powers, he destroys almost half of Paris and rebuilds it with an architect by the name, well, architect's the wrong word. He was more of, a, uh, of an engineer named Hausmann. And this modern Paris, the, this Paris that we think of now, I mean, think of it in these terms. Paris as we know it today was not built until Salt Lake was built. About the same time. It's not as old as we think it is. And, and this plan that you're seeing, these very neat lines and these trajectories that the Paris Opera House fits in, in the middle of, was all designed during the second um, quarter, partially the third quarter of the 19th century. And Napoleon Trois and Haussmann kind of used these dictatorial powers to bulldoze for all kinds. I mean, this is a whole other lecture altogether. But for interesting, for the purposes of this lecture, the Palais Garnier was outside of Haussmann's authority. Haussmann was 
the dictator working under the dictator who controlled everything that was being done in France. If he wanted to pull down your house down, he didn't have to ask anybody for permission. He could just do it. But Napoleon said to Garnier, who was building the Paris all France, you are the one project in all of France that housemen cannot touch. So when you look at this building in the middle of this, you may wonder at this, at the, um, there's a term that we, you know, we massacre it. But this idea that uh, the building isn't communicating potentially as well with the rest of its environment as it could be. And this is a sense of tension um, from its very beginning. Look at its scale compared to the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, there were 147 architects that submitted plans to build the Garnier. And it was going to be the largest, most expensive project for a single building that had been done since Versailles in France. And uh, the only one that, the, the one that won it had this on its, as its, uh, as its, uh, um, on its, as its cover letter. This was the only cover letter they had. Anybody speak Italian here? It says, roughly translated, it says, um, um, uh, aspiring to much, hoping for little. Can you imagine? <laughs> putting that on your term paper. I'm aspiring for a lot here, but I'm not hoping you're gonna go with this. And the person who won it uh, was this man, Charles Bernier. He was the youngest applicant out of the 147. He was 36 years old at the time. He was the son of, the of a blacksmith and he was trained at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris. So he was a story of someone who had risen up through the ranks and who at a very young age and with very little experience was given an enormous project. All eyes were on him. By the way, the person who was considered second place for getting it was somebody who we'll talk about a little bit in this, was this man, Viollet Le Duc. Anybody know projects that Viollet Le Duc was involved in? He, uh, he was not happy about losing. This is a sketch done by Viollet Le Duc for a uh, uh, a, a, a pedestrian walkway under a, uh, a bridge that never came to pass, but he was, uh, oh, you know what you really remember him for is this. Can anybody say what building this is and what his involvement was in it? This is Notre Dame. That's right. What did Viola the Duke do to Notre Dame? Does anybody know? He did the spire. He was going to have two more spires on either side. They were going to go up even higher. Any, anyone else? Restoration. Um, what's that? A restoration. a restoration was part of it. I'm going, I can already tell by the answers I'm getting that I'm going to destroy everybody's Disneyland vision of, of this building. None of these flying buttresses existed in the original um, Notre Dame. They're entirely superficial and added for theatrical effect by the early year. So that that, 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 that all of that, that part that we think of as being so romantically gothic, that is, that is all added on by, by the Le Duc much later. So, into the interior of the Garnier, the Palais Garnier. This is in the upper hall. I'll show you kind of where this is located. Um, throw out some styles of, of that you're seeing here as we're going along. Anybody who's familiar with, with uh, with uh, architectural styles, um, French styles in particular. What are you seeing in this picture? Baroque. Okay, we're seeing Baroque. By Baroque, we mean heavy carving, um, um, muscular is what I generally think of when I'm thinking of the Baroque, okay? That's fair, I see some of the Baroque. We call that Louis XIV in French parlance. What else are we seeing? Anything else? Where on earth are those acanthus leaves from on the base of those pillars? Is that any recognizable Corinthian pattern that we know of? What about the base? A little bit of Egyptian influence in there. It's all over the place, isn't it? Here's the ceiling of the same room, chandelier. Here's the base of the stairs at the grand entrance, one of my favorite features. And one that the tour groups don't often see. What style is this? I'll tell you what Empress Eugenie said, who was the, uh, the wife of Napoleon Troy, after they had been conspiring, after Napoleon Troy, her husband, the emperor, had been uh, conspiring with 
Garnier over the designs. She said in 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 the in the ear uh, in, in in what's the word I'm looking for? In earshot of a of a journalist. What is this style? Is no style at all, not ancient Greek, not Louis Says, not even Louis Kant's. She didn't know. And this is one of the questions that is fascinating that we are going to try and answer today. Not that style matters. I don't really care about style. The question is, um, if you were an architect creating an aspirational building, and you're working somewhat with the expectations of a public, and you are, you've got the weight of history on you, but also the weight of innovation on you, coming from the other direction. This building could not have been predicted by anyone. And on top of its style choices, technologically, it had to be an enormously innovative building. The burden of being an opera house meant that you were holding, on average, this was really kind of the, the secular religion of Europe at the time. And nobody held operas like France did. Um, they were uh, gallows to an extent that we do not even hold them today. The average opera that I think we kind of see now is you know, two, maybe three acts. Then it was very common to add on to the two acts, two more, to the two or three acts, two more acts that was a full cast of, ba of a ballet troupe who was performing in between. Sometimes there were fireworks within the building. And if you look just at the infrastructure here of this is where the audience is. It was the largest and still is one of the largest amphitheaters holding over 2,000 people. I think it's 2,200 that can sit in the space. Look at how much larger the mechanics are of the stage works. And it's even bigger than the Metropolitan Opera is today. And the idea was that you would have all of these mechanics here that would allow you to pull up as many as 15 different sets. And you see all of the cells that go up? How many, how many cells are we going up? How many stories have we got? We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve stair areas the technicians would be in. And then you've got a row of three at the top. All of them working in use and all of them needing to communicate with one another. At the same time, the opera is going on without noise. And this is happening in the 1860s. This is the uh, model that was made later. This was made for the early 20th century of what the building looked like. Um, and you can see that you know, the floor is gradated right here. And you've got, look at how much of a substructure you have in the building to deal with. And here's part of the problem. This is how far away it is from the nearest body of water. It's the red dot over there. So what's your problem going to be? What's that? Well, not fire putting it out. Well, I mean, fire was always a problem. You're absolutely right. Fire is a problem. Yes? Water table. You're going to hit the water table almost immediately. And they did. And this is currently the basement of the Garden of the um, They had to pump out for eight months at a time during construction to let it go back in and not pump it. And by the way, this is where the Phantom of the Opera lives, right? <laughs> and it's true, because in 1910, the building was finished in 1875, and in 1910, um, an accident happens where this chandelier that was designed by Garnier, and this is the chandelier, by the way, in real life. This is Garnier's draftsmanship skills, by the way. Right? How much do you think this chandelier weighs? Just a guess. Somebody said two tons? Not, not even close. Keep going. More than six tons. Nine tons. It weighs nine tons. A cable, one cable came loose in 1910. It's, and, and in the effort to say that one person was killed. And, um, and that is what the basis for Andrew Lloyd Webber's chandelier coming down on the stage came from and then going and running into the into the to the uh, to the watery area, which you can still see. You can go on a tour to the basement of it and I hope they don't play Andrew Lloyd Webber. The uh, the French probably banned Andrew Lloyd Webber. By the way, who did that ceiling? Anybody know? Chagall. Chagall. Oh 
Now, Garnier would roll over in his grave if he saw that. That had nothing to do with anything he was doing. But, uh, but you know, here's the thing. Look at how they held up the chandelier in the interior. Because if it was a dome, the weakest point would be at the center of the dome, right? Right in the oculus. And so what have, what have they done? They look at that set of cables coming from um, iron that's, uh, that, that, that's, that's being used to support it. And look at how long the cable needs to be going down. And uh, it's still taken down once a month for cleaning. Um, I actually found pictures. I just already had too many slides, and I thought, oh, this would be great. So you, you can look that up later. In the middle of the night when you're really bored, look up cleaning Garnier chandelier on Google, and you'll find it. Um, and the decorative um, aspect of the building was um, almost uh, overwhelming. I mean, look at the skill sets that are required here. How many kinds of artisans, artists, sculptors, painters, of all kinds are working on this building at the same time? All of the paintings that you're seeing are being, being measured, the spaces are being measured, they're being painted off-site on campus and put onto the building, the, um, the statues are being carved off-site, here is just what the exterior of the building looks like and the number of artists who are involved on the exterior of the building. These are a list of the greatest sculptors who existed at the time. And, the, and I just want to show three quick sculptures up to the core. Um, Charles Gumbli, who's one of the uh, forgotten masters of the 19th century, um, did these, and he did them with a new technique. They're very light. They're gilt copper electrotype. So they, they, what they did is they, uh, they took copper, they're very light, put it in a bath, and then uh, and, and the same way the silver plate is made, and then electrified it with gold. And there's a very thin layer of gold, and, uh, as I was reading about, um, I found they had not had a gold leaf them since the 1870s when they were originally done because it's been, uh, it's, it, it was that successful work. But he was not the greatest sculptor to work on. Arguably, uh, Carpodic, who was a friend and classmate of Garnier, and when he did this sculpture called La Danse, which was on the exterior of the building, just before the, the, the uh, just the night after the sculpture was put up, which was put up in 1868, the building didn't open until 1875, somebody um, threw ink all over the sculpture because they were worried about nudity. So anybody who thinks that the French are okay with nudity, remember La Danse. And no, they were offended by this, and instead he had to build this. So I just have to have a vote. This is for selfish purposes. Who prefers the sculpture on the left? Raise your hands. Who prefers the sculpture on the right? Raise your hands. Who didn't vote? One more time. Sculpture on the right. Big on, big on. Sorry, the right, 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 sorry, the right. Sculpture on the left? It's almost even. It's almost even. It's interesting. If, we're talking about yours. You're right, so I'm talking about who prefers Excuse me. <laughs> Who prefers this one? Show hands. That's your right. Who prefers this one? It's almost even. You're all wrong. No. There's no, <laughs> there's no answer. It's completely subjective. But um, there were over 500 people who were working on this building over a period of, um, at, who were just on the artisan level. Artisan to sculptor painter level. We're not talking about engineers or office staff. Which, if you think about, um, what it took to build Versailles, it was 350 people who were working on it, at, 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 on that. Um, and it took a longer time to work on Versailles. There were a lot of ways to calculate this. But it's, it's just the idea that building something like this, and we're going to talk a little bit about Versailles, the technology has really not changed. Even today, where you can build an enormous project and have robots do most of the work, right? You have to have a lot of specialists working together under the supervision of someone who can manage the process. And this goes very much to the heart of what it means to be an architect. And before I talk about that, I just want to say quickly, 1870, the war with the Prussians happens. It was a totally needless war. And um, the building project had to stop. And if you ever go to the Palais Garnier, you'll notice that this section 
from here up, from this floor up, is all beautifully gilt. But almost everything else is plain from, the, from, from uh, that level down. And that's because they simply ran out of money and they still haven't completed it. And there's still discussions about whether or not they want to spend another half billion dollars to complete the Garnier Palace. Um, this is one of my favorite artists of all time, Detailier, forgotten master, student of Maisonnier, showing the, uh, what the opening night of the Garnier looked like. But notice when he, when he finally finished the work. It took him three years after the event to finally show the painting. That is a slow photo. Development. It was very slow development. But um, just a few stats here. They had an original budget of 29 million francs, which today is roughly $400 million to do it. And the budget went to 468 million, roughly. And that was only, and they, they, he, he believed that it would take another 400 million to complete what they had started. But they actually spent the money on the sacrifice which is another story altogether. Um, this, is, this is maybe my favorite part, because he wrote this as an op-ed afterwards. It's a bargain of 83 francs per square foot. <laughs> how, many of you, how many of you working architects do those kinds of calculations, where you think, yeah, it's a lot of money, but on a square foot basis, you got a real bargain. <laughs> but here's, here's Here's an, uh, this is not, I don't want to spend all that time on this, but it just goes to show you the best way my plans of mice and men is that six years after they completed this heroic project, they replaced all of the gas lighting with electrical and they had to dig up half the building. Six years after this. So if they'd only waited six years, it was coming down the line. Garnier pronounced it a worldly cathedral of civilization. That's a quote worth well known. We're not going to get to Cathedral, a worldly cathedral of civilization. Journalists at the time paraded it as um, being, be proud of being French when looking at our opera. Foreigners who come to visit this marvel will see that despite our, all our misfortunes, Paris is and always will be without rival. And then one of my favorite authors who said one of the worst things about this building, Richard Sennett, one of our favorite authors, an enormous wedding cake sagging under the weight of its decoration. I don't have to think about what the critics say, because there is some wisdom in, in the contrast of these things. Whatever you can say, it was, it was a marvel. It was a technological marvel, stylistically. It was confusing, but if you've ever experienced it, it is, um, in the true sense of the word, the, the, the word, it is awesome. Awe-inspiring. The scale the level of care and craftsmanship that went into it. And you have to wonder, how could a 36-year-old be put in charge of it, right? How could anyone of any skill level, I mean, is there any 36-year-old architect today in the world who would be ambitious enough to, overtake, uh, to, to undertake this and just oversee so many people? I mean, I want to, this is something we're going to explore. We're going to explore what this meant, the skill level. So that's the end. Let's go to the beginning. Becoming an architect in France. No register of architects or any formal de definition of a profession existed in France until the 19th century. Does anyone know when the first, when the word architect was used to describe a profession, the first usage of the word? It was in France in the 1560s. It's a Greek word. It means chief supervisor of works. You probably could tell me better than that. But it's, you know, roughly breaks down into those. And the French took that as a term and said, French supervisor, we'll use that. But they, 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 uh, they Frankified it. So it's only in the 19th century that it becomes an actual distinguished profession. And it, the France is the origin of where the rest of the schools came from. The school that you're at today, that I toured earlier today at UVU, it has its roots in the French Academy of the 19th century. And the French Academy has its roots elsewhere. Um, until 1742, the Academy Francaise was the only academic institution in Europe offering formal instruction in architecture. So here's the question. Was anybody building anything before 1742 in Europe? Anyone? Was there anything built then? 
Who is building it? Who is in charge of this? Not architects. Essentially architects. We'll find out how essentially you're right or essentially wrong. Can, if you put essentially in front of anything, can you be wrong? Or can you be right? That's your question. Guilt system. The guilt system was the medieval system that ruled how people were trained. And um, it would seem somewhat familiar to us and somewhat, I mean, there, there are vestiges of it today um, that we still have. But I don't want to go into too much detail on this, but it's essentially a system where as a young person, even as young as eight years old, you are apprenticed to someone. And after being apprenticed to them, you work your way up to becoming a journeyman. And journeyman, it's almost exactly what it sounds like. After you get to a certain level of the journeyman skills, you're able to travel and go somewhere else to get experience, ideally, outside of the provincial place where you are to try and broaden your skill set. So you go journeying, you find another master to work with, you become that person's apprentice or assistant. And then you eventually pass the guild's test to become a master in whatever area you work. And everybody had their own system. So if you were a master in the French system, the English would torture you into going through their system. It's almost like being a doctor today in some ways. I mean, you can't just be a doctor in the US and say, hey, I'd like to show up and perform medicine in Russia. Right? You can't do that. That is a vestige of the guild system. Every guild has its own requirements for what it is to be in that guild. And the guilds that were involved in the making of buildings all throughout the medieval period, roughly from the Romans up until the Renaissance, were blacksmiths. What are they making for buildings? What's that? They're making metal. What is metal used for in buildings at this point? I know it sounds like a silly question, but it's a legitimate question. Part of it is that, definitely part of, part of it. Not structural systems yet. Not quite yet. There are some things that are being used and occasionally seen, mostly tools. So think of the precision you need to, and the kind of blacksmiths you need to have good, lasting tools that are working with hard materials, right? Great players, kind of self-evident, right? Carpenters, big part of it, self-evident. Coopers and turners. What are coopers do? Turners. It's one guild, by the way. What's that? Copper. Yeah, coppersmiths. Copper is used for all kinds of decorative elements. It's also used for if you are um, mixing materials that, that are used for large industrial processes, you have to go to the Coopers Guild in order to build these enormous vats that are being used on an industrial process. So it is not just your local tinker who's working on these. You're working on a massive scale in cooperation with them. Goldsmiths. What are goldsmiths doing? This is a very tricky question. Not as much as you think. The goldsmiths were the neurosurgeons of the, uh, of the architectural world. Because they had to work with precious materials, because they had to work with complex chemical processes, and because they had to do these through all kinds of engineered and abstract thinking, they were usually the thinker. They were usually the one designing the buildings. In fact, if you go through Florence and you look at how many goldsmiths were the ones overseeing the building of churches and the makings of sculptures and the makings of roads and engineering? It was the goldsmiths that were mainly the brains behind the operation, um, especially during the Renaissance. Ironmongers, they're doing a lot of the same things that the, uh, that the blacksmiths are doing. Masons, they're making all of the secret societies that pay for it. No, it's not it's not. Um, Plasterers, and... Um, See, am I missing any here? Sawyers. Thatchers. We won't go there. We're going to talk about what this is. Okay, so I'm an art historian. I know I'm talking about architecture. But they were almost inseparable until the 19th century. And that is why I'm qualified to talk about architecture. <laughs> um, at least for the purposes of this lecture. So, what have we got going on here? Anyone? Somebody who's come to my lecture before has seen this. Um, so you can cheat if you've seen this in a previous lecture. This is an important mindset for anyone who's talking about training 
to become anything previous to the 18th or 19th century. What, who is that guy in the middle with the hat? He's the master, okay? Where is his journeyman apprentice? The, the second in command. The guy on the left. Guy on the left. Okay, he's the guy on the left painting. So, you go into the master. The master has his drawing cabinet. He's the one who's designed everything, right? He, he has a pronounced style. It is his own. He's got a secret sauce, whether, you know, it's his, his KFC recipes, spices that you go to. And your job as a journeyman is to paint like him, not to paint like yourself. Okay? You memorize his style, and when someone comes in and says, I want a portrait, I want the cheap version, so I want your journeyman to do it, but I'll pay extra if the master will do the hands and the faces. That's how it works. So, here he is doing the um, uh, St. George Master Commission, and his journeyman is qualified enough to do the portrait. But he's not going to finish it, because the master's going to come look at it. By the way, she can't be left alone with that scoundrel, which is why she's being accompanied by her, her, uh, her friend. Okay, who on earth are those guys right there? And what are they doing? Far right. They're mixing paint. Old or young activity? Why old? Dangerous part of it? A lot of people die of chemical exposure to these things. Especially lead. It was a big one. It's also because if you've got something like lapis lazuli, which even today is more valuable than gold by the ounce when it comes from Afghanistan, if you grind it too much, it loses all its color. So you have to have, what's that? Yeah, yeah, you gotta have the finesse, you've gotta have experienced people who are in charge of these kinds of materials. So the master isn't always the, he's not the only experienced hand in it, right? Look at how they're educating people around here. Who are these guys? These are the young apprentices, as young as eight years old, who live in the master's household, who are paying for the privilege to study there, and eventually, they want to be that guy, but they can't be that guy in his studio, they have to go to somebody else's studio to do it. And then they have to paint their masterwork and become a master in the guild. So if you're an architect, or if you're one of these guild members, this is the stonemason's guild. Master. Journeyman Apprentice. And then you've got, just imagine, there's no way we can see it all right now. This is a 16th century print. Think of all the people that have to be involved if you are a stonemason. You have to have people who are, who are identifying the stone on, uh, at, the, at the site, who are able to extract the stone, who are able to carry the stone down, who are there, then able to uh, put the stone in its gradations of quality. And then you have to have people who can work at various levels of the reduction process. Often, I remember talking with um, somebody who was an expert on Michelangelo or Cambridge who said that um, we often share this, this, um, this quote that Michelangelo and many artists like Bernini were a, would, would have their journeymen carve the block all the way down to about a millimeter of where it needed to be. And then they would do the veining because that was the work that they only trusted the, uh, the, the, the master to do. Think of how many times the block cracked before it got to the millimeter, right? It took experts all along the way to get there, right? So if you're the master overseeing this, it takes a whole host of masters within their particular area within the workshop to get there. It's these guilds who are all working together until how did that go louder? Did I just lean down? Things are happening. Until this. Anyone want to talk about what this building is? Versailles. Versailles. Thank you. This is Versailles. 17th century, built by the genius and insane, I shouldn't say built by, inspired by the genius and insane. King of France, the Sun King Louis XIV, who assumed the throne when he was four years old and ruled for, I think, 72 years. Has that been beaten by Queen Elizabeth yet? Not quite. We're getting close. We're getting close to that. She may beat the Sun King. 
But she didn't start when she was four years old. Um, Versailles was the most ambitious project that had ever been done, arguably. I don't know. I should stop making comments like that, because how do you compare railway making and creative design? That's a comment for another time. The point is, is that this building was meant to impress. It had changed everything. It changed everything, and it's the reason why you were here studying architecture today. That's the connection we make. We're going to get there. This, too, to be said for the king, that if his ambition might seem to be set on his personal glory, I should say, he identified France with himself and believed that in glorifying himself, he was, in fact, glorifying his country. This building was impressive. It had 1,200 fireplaces, 700 rooms, 67 staircases. It could accommodate within the building 20,000 people. I have a note here that there were 2,153 windows. How can there be less than half fireplaces in the world windows? I can't see that. 1,200 and then 2,153 windows? I wonder how they're calculating panes or windows. It's got to be windows. What's that? That's none of your business where the chimneys are. No. <laughs> they're all here. No, you can see them. You can. You can you can see, it, it, this isn't the shot that gets all the chimneys. I'm not doing justice to the chimneys <laughs> with that shot. I'm definitely not. Um, the gardens, too. It was on almost 2,000 acres. Um, every year, even today, a quarter of a million flowers and a quarter of a million trees are planted to this day because they take them down in return and they, they replant them. Um, the Hall of Mirrors, which is not nearly as impressive now as when it was originally done. You see, what is the predominant color of metal in there? It's gold. When it was first built, it was silver, and it was solid sterling silver. But when the Thirty Years' War happened and Louis needed to pay for that war, he melted down all the silver furniture and chandeliers in order to pay for the war and replaced it with beechwood furniture that was gessoed and gilt with leaf. So, it's now... Now, gilt furniture, and before it was solid sterling furniture. It was in all. Um, and to build this, the problem was, is the guilds were, first of all, not capable of doing all of this work. It required, on a scale, something that had never been done before. And um, what, what did Louis do? Where did he go to? Does anybody know? where he went for his talent to, to oversee this? Italy. What's that? Italy. He went to Italy. He poached the Italy All-Star team. He took them from Florence, he took them from Rome, and then he put over all of them um, a man who had, um, who had studied in France, Charles Le Brun, and he, he, was, he was essentially a, 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 an attack a talophile Frenchman who had lived several years in France, and he oversaw all of the guilds. Now, this is important. This is important to know. Um, how many of you are painters in here? Okay, you have all been demoted because it used to be the painters took the place of the goldsmiths, and they were in charge of the entire process. Because if you were a painter, you had to reproduce three-dimensional space in two dimension, so it was believed that you could understand perspective better than anyone else who was in the arts, better than sculptors even, because sculptors, you know, they can just do what they see, right? That's not true. I know sculptors are here. I'm not trying to make fun of you anyway. But it's the idea that painters were considered to be the top of the intellectual um, pyramid here. And um, while he was there, and he had this all-star team of people who were doing everything in Versailles that made this possible, he decided we need to abolish the guild system in France and create an academy. The Academy of Architecture was inaugurated on the 3rd of December, 1671. It was the first institution to be devoted solely to the study of architecture, and school was the first dedicated to the explicit training of architects. That is 90 years from the first use of the word architect. The first school was formed. And it was formed out of the need 
not to have somebody who could oversee it, but I had a very different idea. Before I tell you what that is, let's read a couple more quotes. The school used the title Academy because of the significant nuance of the term had acquired during the time of the Renaissance. Thus, the new French institution, sorry for that though, implicitly inherited the Italian academic reputa re reputation and its associations with genius and social elitism. Do you feel like social elites you are, Cass? You should. You should. Because it really did come from this idea that it was an intellectual experience being architect, not one to get your hands dirty, which was very different than the guild system. Because the guild system was working entirely almost with people who were crafts people, right? Who then aspired outside of that system to oversee other crafts people. This is people who have never dealt with crafts, who are overseeing potentially people who do crafts. And their first version of it was to not only set up a school in France, but to go to the Academia in, in Florence, which this is an image commemorating, to show how the French and Italians were going to bridge the gap and further the Renaissance, not in Italy, but to further it in France. And you can see here what they believe are the skills needed to be an architect. What are some of the skills you need according to this image, to be an architect. Sacred geometry. Okay, sacred geometry. Sacred geometry. I, I, think, you're, I think you're right. I don't, we'll hold the word sacred for later. It's not, there's anything wrong with that word. Um, because I don't know if they have the distinction. I think they just believe that geometry was all divine, right? So there wasn't a distinction from other geometry. That's the point I want. All geometry was discovering the secret of the universe, which was God's creation, right? Okay, so you've got geometry on a canvas, and what are they trying to figure out on that canvas? Anybody who's a mathematician? What are they, what are they working out? Three-dimensional perspective. Three-dimensional perspective, a biggie. When had th three-dimensional perspective been invented? Um, 1460s and 70s, it was being used in art by Montaigne. And my, is there anybody who can predate it to that? Brunelleschi. What's that? Fourteen oh five Brunelleschi working on the on. Okay, so it's not. A, this is not that old of a, of a skill for the Europeans themselves, right? Um, what else are they trying to work out? Perspective. What are the things going on at the top? Yeah. Drawing. Trying to work out drawing. And you know, that's a big part of what's happening over here. What's going on on the top left? Anatomy. Anatomy. Why anatomy in a school of architecture? Proportion. Proportion. Man is the measure of all things. It was a phrase that you heard very often. Man is the measure of all things. The body is the ultimate measure of structure and proportion as it should be in buildings. And you can also see that those circles, notice how some of them are cut to the ground a little bit, the horizon. That has to also do with how structures are being built and thought out. Okay, moving on. Rather than functioning as a school, the Academy of Architecture, I'm not going to try the French, my romance language is Spanish, and I'll just embarrass myself, I'm sorry, was initially envisaged to be a collector of architectural thought intended to provide a library of knowledge for the king. Its principal endeavor was to establish les règles les plus justes et les plus correctes de l'architecture, which I did try a little bit of French. It wasn't that bad. It wasn't that great. It wasn't that bad. A lot of fun. Um, so what is this school? Is this a school in the way we think of it? What is it? Library. It's a library. And what they're doing is they're publishing their findings. They're going and they're, they're, they're measuring buildings. They're taking ancient knowledge that they're finding that's already published in one form or another. And um, they are they are issuing um, philosophical opinions on what architecture should be. So from the introduction of the course of architecture that was published, the, the volume five, 
the, all these volumes were recently published in the 1920s. So if you look up Blondel, who was the 17th century French architect that published the first philosophical works, you can find all of them on archive.org. And this is from volume five. I'm never embarrassed to boldly pronounce that there exist proportions which cause architecture to become beautiful and elegant, and which are stable in constant principles of mathematics, so that through meditation, one can draw the infinite series of useful consequences and rules for the construction of buildings. A stonemason? An ironmonger? Is that the kind of practical advice we're getting? What kind of advice are we getting from these people, these architects, these so-called architects? How do we feel about this quote? Do we, does, do we have feelings about this idea now? Beauty and elegance? These, are these controversial terms today? Yeah. You think so? Anybody else agree? Why are they controversial? Good answer. A really good answer. Yeah. And maybe this is something that, um, and I'm 100% I'm with you, because I think that the, the thought that I have as we're saying that is living in the somewhat homogenous culture of 17th century France is very different than living in the 21st century multicultural system that we live in today. And the idea of pronouncing that there was a shared canon at that time versus now proclaiming that one canon is particularly beautiful or not beautiful which is the burden that critics of this system have, right? <laughs> they, they say that, that there's, and this is a much longer discussion, that by proclaiming one thing beautiful, you're saying that it's superior, and yada, yada, yada. Point is, we're living in a world, they're living in a world where they are also struggling with the vocabulary, but for different reasons than we are. They're establishing taste, right? where almost no philosophical basis for taste exists, let alone a library. These 10 or 11 volumes that are created in the 17th century, you could fit almost all of the architectural tomes that had been published up until this point on a shelf, on one shelf. They're trying to establish a ground level for what are the tools of our trade, what are the philosophical things. It's almost like saying, you know, I would like to start a thing called a restaurant. Do you know what a restaurant is? We serve food. Wait, wait, you make it too? And can people eat it there? Or do you just make it? Or do you serve it? I mean, this is the kind of basic questions they're asking about what is it that we believe as architects? And one very key idea, idea that we need to think of here that is different from us is that the past was way better than the present that they lived in. The, if you were growing up, does anybody know who the Jetsons are? Okay, I'm not that old, right? Jetsons, you know who the Jetsons were if you lived in the 17th or 18th century France? They were the ancient Greeks and Romans and Egyptians. Those guys were floating around in cars, and they were, and, and we as Europeans were still living in dirt, right? We need to figure out what was lost from that glorious, utopian, Arcadian past. And once we figure that out, we are going to be living in the greatest society that had ever existed. So what we need to do is we need to go back to the past. And in some regards, there was some truth to it. Right? There was some truth to technology, to... Um, I, I was just reading an article, look, I'm not an architect, about uh, how... Um, they found that Roman concrete is something like 50 times more stable than our concrete today because they make the, mix a the particular kind of volcanic ash in with their concrete. And it wears at a much slower rate than our concrete does. Don't you feel kind of dumb when you hear that? <laughs> and you think, ah, 
why don't we think about panic ash? Right? Why wasn't there some guy in a lab occasionally spooning ash into this stuff? Right? The Romans had figured it out, but that's how they thought about everything. And the real brains behind the French Academy becomes the basis for everything in the 19th century, almost everything, was Antoine Desgaudet. He lived from the mid-17th to the early 18th century, and he was sent on what is called the Prix de Rome. So this is one of the first institutions that was created by the Academy. This is how it worked. It was already a habit of going to Europe, to, to, uh, if you lived in Northern Europe, to go on a grand tour to all of the great building sites of, of medieval to ancient times. Couldn't really go to Greece because it was controlled by the Ottoman Empire, so you kind of had to stop in, in Rome, or you'd be able to go to parts of Greece, but not all of them. But the idea when the academy started is, let's not just go there as tourists, or as, as dilettante um, noblemen. Let's go there and let's figure out how everything was done in the past by sending someone there every so many years to bring back knowledge to us. He measured buildings just as they stood without any attempt at restoration, incorporating as many details as possible, the whole undertaking being carried out with a degree of thoroughness and accuracy that had never been done before. So, he's going to the Pantheon. He's measuring it with an entire team of people. He's a nobleman, essentially. But he's been given the imprimatur, the seal of approval of the academy. They promise to publish whatever he comes back with, and they promise to fund, almost like he's the Indiana Jones, right? To go and measure these buildings as they are, and to come back and publish them for everybody else. And he's creating all kinds of studies on each building. And after this point in the mid-18th century, when they started having these works, the academy then shifted again. The eminent architects of the king had named his academicians, met once a week to share their learning, their discussions were intended to solve architectural problems. So here were the topics of discussion set down in their books, of which we have the minutes of every week when they would meet. Geometry, arithmetic, mechanics, hydraulics, fortifications, perspective, stone cutting. They would discuss these each week as a topic, and they would discuss it in terms of what was the ancient world doing. Not what are we doing today, or what did the guilds learn. They would not invite guild members who were still working along with it. They were having this entire piece of discussion as to what happened in the past. So, we still haven't met the intellectual with the practical, right? The purpose of art and architectural academies was to assert power and prestige in the state, a concern gaining control. Uh, with gaining control over educational institutions from the guilds, the question of how art and architectural academies should teach was much less significant. It was a power play. It was politics. It was the Democratic and Republican election all over again. Sorry, I shouldn't have brought up politics. Anyway, it's this idea that it was very much an intellectual and not a practical body. It was a very frustrating world to be a part of. You're not dealing with really contemporary subjects of building. You're dealing with ancient subjects. You're borrowing from Vitruvius, from Palladio. You've got your own people that are going down and measuring things. There are disagreements about how things were measured. There's not even an agreement on the standard measuring system at the time. They end up building their first school, which, does anybody recognize this building? You do? Tell us. Where is it? It's um, Michael? It's the Institut Francais today. Right? And it was originally called the Institute of Foreign Nations. They first occupied that building, and this is where they would have the weekly discussions. Then they moved to this building on the other bank of the, of the Seine. They moved to the, uh, to the Louvre. And um, the first project that they undertook that was practical within their own country was in 1678. They decided to measure all of the churches in France that were ancient. And they published a book on it. Then they become kind of practical. Because then it meant that somebody would come to them and say, I've got a three-story building I'd like to build. What is the most stone I could put on top of that building before it crumbles? And by this time, the guilds were a little more folded in. Because they were invited to meetings. And 
they were building up a library and a group of people who were taking almost like um, discussion boards questions of what architectural project are you working on? And the questions are extremely mundane. I can't imagine being a translator of these archives. It's essentially how deep do the foundations have to go? How, how wide do the stones have to be? Which corner do I have to stop on? How do I pump out um, um, these uh, water where I'm building? Can I build where there's water? And this is the process through which the academy and the guild system starts to meld together in one institution. And they start giving each other the same titles, right? So academics get guild certificates, and guild leaders start being named as academicians by the king. You get a melding together of the, of the practical and the philosophical, and then they start folding in to ancient buildings the practical questions that the guild members had answers to in their own way, but they're trying to figure out how the ancients did it in the same or different way they were doing it. So, what did you have to do to be enrolled? Okay, let's pretend you were all enrolled in the academy and raise your hand to signify you're enrolled, okay? If you do not qualify for one of the things I'm about to show you, keep your, keep your hands way up. I want you to raise your hand. Keep your hand up if you're male. You can't be in the school. Keep your hand up if you're between the ages of 15 and 30. I saw somebody literally pump their hand and be like, yeah, <laughs> awesome. Did you work in an atelier before you were put in school and you got a letter of recommendation from a practical working architect before you even got there? What's atelier? Atelier studio. Have you been working in the, in the studio of a working architect? Mm -hmm. Oh, so we got some over there. And look, you're all very cliquish. <laughs> you're all hanging out in the same area. Did you all know that when you sat down together? Is this one atelier that's been working together? Okay, so this is what it's starting to look like. They start focusing on, I'm going to read this quote, they start focusing on spoken lectures only. It lasted two to three years. This is to become an architect. The courses went from November to September. You had summers off. It's the way you want it. Four hours of lectures until 1755. After 1755, you have eight lectures, eight hours a week, four hours of mathematics, four hours, I should say, of architecture. The different notions, rules, and practices of architecture, in all, a course on the principles of architecture and knowledge needed for the practice. So, now it's not just lectures, it's mathematics. Well, it's not just, it's not just the philosophical, what have you do in the past. It's now we're going to teach a group of students who are between the ages of 15 and 30, how to become us. This did not happen until 1717. And, um, and how do they become us? By studying mathematics and studying architecture, by which they meant ancient architecture. Patron and atelier. Now this is, we'll talk about when we get to uh, the name of song. But this is an important paradigm. What were these people building, these architects that came out of the school? This is what they were building. They were building standalone noble households. They were almost exclusively for the upper classes. They were not building streets. They were not building bridges. They were not building anything that was really urban. Okay? They are going out into the countryside and they are building um, the, uh, the 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 uh, um, they're, they're building the dreams of wealthy people, right? At this point. They don't have to solve the kind, I mean, they've got ambitious things that they're doing, but they're not, on, it's not a quality of life of raising up the quality of, the, 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 the well-being of society at this point, right? It's still very much noble architects who are working mostly intellectually, directing the plans of guild-level craftsmen for other noble, noble. And um, that starts to change. It starts to change in the 18th century as cities become bigger. And this has um, consequences. Boulay was the first real practical architect to work in Paris. And this is a description of his workshop from somebody who lived at the time. He made some 200 drawings for rooms in the Elysee when they were occupied by Goujon. 
The designs of this period were submitted on plain paper from Holland, Holland paper. Um, the architect used graphite fitted into slender holder. Before they had a pencil, they used slender holder. A drawing pen or a quill, elevations and sections might have been touched up with watercolor mixed from a palette containing small blue, green earth, yellow lake, gallstone, carmine, or beast. To impress those unresponsive to the abstract nature of plants. I love that quote. How many of the architects do you like for that? To impress those unresponsive to the abstract nature of plants. The architect turned to mock-up models, which might be of limewood, service tree, or walnut, cardboard, or Montmartre soapstone. How many of you are making 3D models as part of your work? That really didn't happen in the same... I mean, there were some three-dimensional models that happened. We have accounts of them happening in Greece and Rome. But it really became industrialized in the 18th century. And, and as he's making these, there was a bureaucracy whose job it was to oversee that the models match the finished product. And that started in the 1770s. Until Jacques-Louis David. Jacques-Louis David. He was the painter of this work, who recognizes this. One of the most famous works in the history of art history. But since you're architects, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect all of you to, to see this. He was a classicist. He studied in the academy. And um, he was also one of the chief revolutionaries of the academy. He studied in Rome, on the of Rome as a painter. He studied a little bit as an architect as well. He comes back from Rome. He joins the revolutionaries. He paints the famous tennis court oath. And on, in 1793, he says, In the name of mankind, in the name of justice, for the love of art, and above all for the young, let us destroy, let us annihilate these two deadly academies, which can no longer remain under a free regime, as an act of admission, I have done my duty, you decide. And that same afternoon, they, this was a vote. All the academies and literary societies licensed or endowed by the nation are abolished. 1793, everything that had been built up to that point, all the academies canceled by the revolution. Which then meant that all of this knowledge in these libraries, what was going to happen to it? There was actual burning of books going on, people going into the Academy of Architecture and, uh, and, and, and tearing it down. And, um, and you know, we think that we're so cool because we have modernism and the Impressionists and, and uh, the Picasso and you know, in the 19th century, the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th. Those guys were so mod. They were just, they, they were copying what had happened 100 years earlier. And what happened 100 years earlier included the guillotine and the burning of books. It was a lot more vicious than what happened at the end of the, of the, of the 19th century. It led to our version of modernism. It led to the building of the kind of area now we're looking at at the moment, right? This is, this is the first revolution against the academy. And um, we, can, we can thank one person for saving architecture. And I'm going to call this the title of my book if I decide to write this. The Miracle of Julien David Le Horry. Doesn't look very cons conspicuous. Kind of looks like a Quaker oak guy. Right? He was an academician who was friends with David, which is why David did not notice what he was doing in the background. Um, he was the 18th century equivalent of the Indiana Jones that they needed. He studied at the Académie Française from, uh, sorry, at the École des Beaux Arts in the 18th century from 1751 to 54. He gets the Prix de Rome, only he doesn't go to Rome. He finds an Ottoman emperor, friend of an Ottoman, an Ottoman emperor, who gives him a passport to travel through Athens, Corinth, and Sparta. He's the first Westerner to go and measure those places. And he measures and creates this book, which becomes a kind of Bible in the 19th century for how Greece was understood. So remember, Greece is kind of partially understood through the Romans up to this point. Am I right on this? And so now you get somebody who's actually going to Greece, a European going into Ottoman <coughs> Turkish territory, and he's creating these very detailed plans. And this isn't very far removed from that. 
time. So we're only talking a few hundred years. And, but the distance from them to Rome is way far, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to Athens is way far. I mean, this is modern history that he's going back and he's copying these sites. And he's building every kind of plan you can think of. Leroy is hailed by scholars at the center of the, the systematic chronological model of architectural progress. He is inconsistently labeled an archaeologist, an historian, an antiquarian, an architect, and even an engineer. He becomes the inspiration behind this building. Anyone want to name what that building is? That is the Pantheon. So, he becomes kind of the darling of the revolutionaries who are celebrated in this building, but secretly, the remnant of the School of Architecture was retained largely because Leroy, who was the professor of the Academy Royal of Architecture, at the point it was abolished, abolished and Leroy had been conducting a school at his own home. Even the pre de emulacion, God, oh, my Spanish is getting it, isn't it? Emulacion, I should say in Spanish. Competitions were carried out at his house instead of a stipend, a highly styled stipend of Rome. Students of Leroy's school immediately after the Academy's abolition had to do with books from the old libraries that he gave them for prizes. So, there's a 15 year gap where Leroy keeps the School of Architecture alive, secretly, training architects under his, his supervision, sending people on virtual pre-to-Rome competitions, and giving and, and funding a prize, paying for their for, for their first few years out of the school to become architects. And once the um, architectural once the revolution ends, um, they decide again to start the academy. And who takes over the academy? All of Leroy's students take over. And they rule until 1865. And it is Leroy's students that train Garnier. That's how we got there. Okay? Leroy's students are the ones who train Garnier. But by this time, because the academy is functioning in secret, Kind of, now it's kind of open secret at this point. They're all immediately getting jobs as civil engineers in the military in Napoleon's army. So what do engineers do? Civil engineers for armies do. They build bridges, they build walls, they build all kinds of useful things. And you have finally the synthesis that becomes the school of architecture of the 19th century and afterwards, which is architects, need to be trained in classical backgrounds, the intellectual bearings of Western civilization, but they ultimately need to apply those to practical, usually urban projects, public buildings. And the strange thing is, is that the private buildings that were once the, this is where the coup is entirely fulfilled, is that who are the people who are building a lot of the big homes here in Utah? They're not often architects. A lot of them are contractors who have never been to architectural school, right? So now you have a complete switch around where the people who are building the pricey wealthy homes and the homes of the wealthy all throughout Europe in the 19th century are rarely the architects. The architects, because of Napoleon and because of this, this kind of abolishing and then melding in of the civil service and the architects together, now all of the urban projects have been taken away from the guilds, over by the architects, and all of the wealthy projects, all of the, the dream, non-practical projects are taken over by contractors who have building experience but no intellectual basis in what they're doing. That's harsh. It's an I'm not trying to say that. So let's talk quickly about Garnier. Have I got 10 minutes left? Is that what I got? Okay, we're gonna go fast with the Garnier. Here we go. This says a lot. When Garnier's widow wanted to include the inscription of Charles Garnier, son of a blacksmith, among the list of accomplishments on the rear face of the monument where he was buried, um, Jean Leon Jerome, the greatest painter and the president of the Academy at the time, had a conniption fit. He said, No, he is, the, he is the son of his work, the child of his work, and that is where he gains all of his glory. 
Garnier was a product, and this is what I, oh, this is a very abstract point that I'm making that these two quotes put together. But the point I'm trying to make is that if you were an architect in 17th or 18th century France, you had to start as a nobleman. In the 19th century, and the system you have inherited, you can be from anywhere. And you can rise up through the ranks and become, based on the merits of your education, the person with the monument who's building the greatest, most glorified building in the entire, entire country, right? Kind of world. At age 13, he was um, employed as somebody who was a verifying architect. In other words, he was there to make sure that architectural plans matched up with what the, what the architects were doing. But when he, his mother, two weeks into his apprenticeship, found out that he was mostly um, drinking and smoking, he, uh, he was taken out of there and put into a primary school. And this is significant. Because only one out of 50 people in Paris at the time, and he was raised in Paris, only one out of 50 children went to primary school. And then he started going to the Ecole de Dizine. Dizine or Dizine? Dizine. Thank you very much. Dizine. And um, this was a school that was founded in 1838 by this man. It was mostly a night school. Imagine sending your 13-year-old child, nowadays, to a day to, to, to school during the day. It was a very hard school. It was run by Catholic priests for the most part. And it was slapped a lot of fingers, right, if they were doing it wrong. And then at night, your child also had to go to school. And that's what had happened under the auspices of Le Ville, um, um, uh, Guillard, who created a school that was the first artisan school in Paris to train people in very basic skills. Mathematics, arithmetic, geometry, trigonometry, architecture, architectural stereotomy. Stereotomy. Do you know what stereotomy is? Yes? Yes. That's right. So it was how to, how to fit physical objects into three-dimensional space. Kind of stuff that, you know, maybe you'd be learning as a 13-year-old when it came to, um, to coding. It was the equivalent of coding at the time. This is very complex mathematical thought. Ornamental sculpture design. And uh, I love this. This is how, this is the level, the hierarchy. The figures and animals were better than ornaments and flowers. Architectural drawings were after that. And graphic design was last. I'm sorry, graphic. Um, and they had competitions, and Garnier studied at the school, and we have a record. He graduated, he, he graduated when he was 16 years old from this school, which started at night, and then he started going in the day, during the day. And he was not, there are very few times that you see first prize on there. But look at the skills that he learned before he became an architect at the design school. He's learning and winning awards in arithmetic and geometry. Gosh, I'm spelling, I'm sorry, guys. Um, stere stereotomy, carpentry. He's building a lot in wood. He's building a lot in stone. He's doing ornamental work. Um, his professors, his professors are sharing time between the design school and the School of Fine Arts. Bile Le Duc is an assistant professor there at the same time at the design school. And his classmates, he said he learned more from than even the teachers. And all of these people become involved in the building of the Palais Garnier. So it's not just the academy that's building the, the Garnier Palace in the end. It's the people who are learning carpentry and ornamental design as 15, 14, 15, and 16 year olds that are learning these skills. And who know each other their entire lives. So by the time he's 36, he'd already learned two decades earlier carpentry, stonemasonry, and a lot of these, I'm not saying that he learned it to the level that maybe a master would during the guild system, but he's got a familiarity with it, right? Then he gets into the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. Again, the requirements. Sorry, ladies, you have to be male, 15 and 30. This hadn't changed from the 17th century. Um, you have to work with an architect. And so the whole time that he is at that school of, of design, he is being apprenticed in order to get admitted into the Ecole de Beaux Arts. And he starts with Leviel, who was a winner of the, uh, of the Prix de Rome, but he turned out to be 
a drunkard and a very uh, abusive person. And uh, imagine if you're a 15 or 16 year old being apprenticed to somebody and you have to go home and tell your mom, I'm not really learning anything, but this nationally award winning architect is just drunk all day. That's what happened. Mother pulls him out and then he goes to um, a school where he's um, working with Lit Bob. I'm going to show you one of Lit Bob's works. But from the ages of 16 to, tw to 20, he's working with Viola Le Duke to do architectural drawings. And these are some of the drawings he does. We believe he did this at about the age of 16. How's he doing? 16 year old. Pretty good? Pretty good. Okay? His second teacher, Labat, um, produced more pre Rome winners than any other architect in his atelier in the history of France. 15 architectural winners. He designed this building, and Garnier, when he was asked what kind of inspiration he'd get from his teacher, was this is the only thing I heard him say over and over again every day. C'est très bien, très bien, continue. Good, really good. You know what you're doing. He said that his teachers were totally uninspiring um, in, in, in that way. But what really made him were his classmates. And he goes to the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, and guess what happens? I've got three minutes left. I'm going to go through this really fast. His teacher is this guy. Now, if you had to guess just from this image how stern or exciting <laughs> this individual is, his name was Baltard. The Baltard architecture was governed by the rules of good taste and defined, it's one of those key words, good taste, defined by the classical orders, embodied by the monuments of classical Greece, and perpetuated success successively by the architects of ancient Rome, the Italian Renaissance, defending those who, in their orthodoxy, retain the rigor of Vitruvius, of Vitruvius' precepts. He attacked both eclecticism of the Romantics and the barbarity of the Gothicists. And this is the building that he's most famous for. In Lyon is the, uh, the Palace of Justice. Um, and throughout all that, Garnier suffered. He hated it. His assistant and friend throughout the Palais Garnier said this about him. He was curious and constant, Garnier, but he didn't distinguish himself in mathematics, nor in construction, nor in architecture, until he won the grand prize. And that's when he won the Prix de Rome in 1848. I'm going to show you the drawing that he won it with. He was told to make a school of design for his Prix de Rome contest. And there were others who created them. But this was his proposal as a, a, as a graduate of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts for what a school of architecture should look like. Can you see kind of the, the classrooms and the studios? Can you see some of the uh, areas where, where uh, it's 1848, he's born in 1925. So how old is he? 22 years old at this point. So this is the work he's doing when he's 23. You can kind of go along the length of the building and see you know, the various. So we could dive into this, but I'm not going to dive into depth because I've got to show you what he does when he gets to Rome. Because he goes to Rome and he's there for five years. And this is the last leg of his education. This is the end of the lecture. Okay? This is the last set of skills he needed to learn, according to the Ecole de Beaux Arts. He gets pensioned in Rome. He's under the supervision of the academy which are not working architects. These are all lecturers. And his first three years, his job is to study monuments. Year one is a detailed study of, a detailed study. Not, it studies of detail, so I should have written that out. A sectional of an ancient monument in his second year. A complete survey of ancient monuments for his third year. The fourth year he's in Rome, he's supposed to complete the restoration of an, of a, of an antique monument. Isn't that a cool idea? Your job is to take a ruin and then complete it. Um, and you couldn't use AIDS, which they all did. But. And then you're supposed to create a new building at the end of it. So I'm going to show you his first through fifth year. I've only, I've only got the first through four years. We don't know what building was created. In fact, some people think that he skipped it entirely because he brown nosed enough that he didn't have to do the work. And they were all infamous, by the way, in architecture school for spending the entire year just touring and looking at sites and then not creating anything until the last two weeks. Sound familiar? <laughs> okay. This is his first year work for which he, he, was, he was sent to Rome to study. 
a detail from Trajan's one. Second year, Temple of Vesta. He also sent the, uh, the an, another. Uh, he studied a fresco for his uh, his fourth year. Sorry, fourth year he does this. He does the Temple of Jupiter. And then this is him recreating a building that had fallen apart. So, fast forward 18 years, and this is him working in his studio on the Pelagian. What do you see in his studio? What kind, what's that? Say that again? Yeah. Ornament examples. What else do you see? Tractors. Draft. Oh, drafters. Drafters. Okay, drafters. Thank you. Drafters. What else do you see? You see what? A guild. A guild? That's an interesting observation. I think you do. I think you do. And remember, these are a lot of these classmates are people that he'd been working with in his education since he was 13, 14, 15 at the Ecole de, de Saint. What else do you see? What kinds of charts has he got on the wall? He has floor plans. He has floor plans. So, I'm going to end with this question. What kinds of skills did his education, what, how did his education prepare him for this? That's one, that's my first question. A lot of different, he'd seen a lot, he'd seen a lot by this point, yes. He understood the mediums that he was working with. What kind of mediums did he understand? Carpentry and stonework, just aerial hunting works. <laughs> yes, absolutely. What else? Was he building it like the ancients did? How is it like? How is it like the ancients, and how is it different than the ancients? I feel like this is like the ancients. It was built to resemble the classical order, but I think he went overboard with the extravagance. I oh, those are fighting words. You get points for the spinal tap records. <laughs> I don't disagree with you. It's a great point. Kind of go off and going off of what he said, but because of his training and understanding of traditional design, a lot of his, his dreams were to one that design that had been showed the class to me for many years. So he, he understood a lot of traditional architecture, but he made it his own and made it and he innovated with it. So here's a guy who had worked for Viollet le Duc, who pioneered um, the weight bearing of, of metal structures, right? And he also, during this time, worked on seeing a lot of failed buildings that were actually being constructed. Plus, he's called the ancient buildings. And you got to look at these plans as somebody who, they look at the Viollet le Duc dome arch supports that are happening in the cupola, right? Ultimately, it's a stone-bearing building, right? I mean, this is an ancient technique, right? I mean, he is, he's figuring out how stone is going to bear its own weight over the building. But he's also incorporating all of the, the pulley systems and, and modern technological advancement of, of that backstage element, right? I mean, this is a real synthesis of someone who's got ancient, modern, philosophical ideas, style ideas, but also he's been through the ringer when it comes to practical ideas as someone who was apprenticed all along
to people who had to build practical buildings working in an office as a civil servant. So by the time he was 36, just I just have to say that his 36 is not our 36, right? He had a different 36 than we did. His 36 is probably our 68, right? Further reading, quick read, City of Life. This is one of the great, I know you don't have a lot of time. Maybe you want to spend spring break maybe delving into this a little more. You can read this in an hour and a half. Unbelievable book. One of the best parts about it is they just talk about how Paris was ripped up. And they do it very quickly and how it was put back together. And maybe the most amazing part of it is the part that surprised almost everybody internationally, which is how the sewer systems in France work. Which doesn't sound that exciting. Pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. And, and they talk a lot about Garnier. There's an entire chapter dedicated there. On Garnier, if you want to learn all about how he built it, if you want to learn about his biography, this is the definitive book. And if you don't want to buy this book, look up Charles um, Curtis Mead, because um, he did, this is his published PhD. And if you are at UVU, you have access to his PhD through intercollegiate library sharing. You can read a PDF. I, I don't have access to that anymore because I was educated in the British system, and so I have no access to U.S. universities anymore. Maybe somebody can help me with that at some point. And then if you want to learn more about the Academy, this is the greatest book. It was published just last year. You can get it as an e-book. And you can learn about how the Academy morphed. I probably massacred a lot of what this book um, will lay out more clearly than I did. The parting thought is, is that your education that you're receiving here, I was touring around, which is, um, if I understand it, kind of a, a looking at classicism in a way that is a little bit against the grain from what some schools have been doing since the turn of the century. And um, you should know that this isn't the only school that's doing that. The model that was established really during the beginning of the 19th century is now being returned to by the Ecole de Beaux Arts. If you want to see some really fiery debates on classicism, type in Architecture Academy and go through Google Translate and go to French websites. And you will see that the Garnier model of education is what is being reinstituted in France today. And with that, thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm sorry if I went a little over, but I'm just welcoming this. I'm happy to stay for questions. I'm sure we have one or two questions out there. Before we take questions, just a reminder. In two weeks, we have Bob McAlpine coming. The lecture is free on Wednesday night, and then he's going to do these uh, tours, uh, three of the homes they built here in Utah. And if you're interested, you've got the sign up sheet up here. Right here. here. Questions? What are you visiting? This? Yeah. You're a Vermonter. Anybody ever lived in Latin America? It's an, it's an herbal tea from Latin America. Yeah. Yeah, this, yeah. Should have. Yeah, any other questions? I would be happy to touch on Monte. I love Monte. Yeah? So, uh, when did the idea that the Academy of Architecture turned into the Cultural Arts, was that the same synonymous term? Or did they not synonymous. They were totally. So, there was the Academy really until the end of the 18th century when David abolished it through his persuasion the government. Revolutionary government abolished it. And then you had Napoleon who said, you know what, 1803, so 1893 it's abolished. 1803 Napoleon says, we should really go back to the academy. But since we don't want to make those guys upset, let's just call it an institute. So they call it the Institut Francais. And the Institut Francais has, um, and I didn't, I didn't share this earlier, but it has, um, this is what it looks like. I skipped it over. Skipped over it. It has, um, and you can see where, it's, where the, uh, the, the, the architects fit into the hierarchy here by numbers. Painters are still the bosses when it starts. 
And their job is not to actually hold classes in, as an institute. Their job is to kind of oversee the curriculum. It's the equivalent of a kind of federal model. Correct me if you think I'm, I'm, I'm messing up on anything on this, but it's, um, it's almost like you have their the Department of Education, and they don't actually teach. They just set out standards, and they oversee and supervise the calls as they happen. So you have um, the, the, the Le Roy Academy comes back at about 1803, about this time, and they, they kind of move from his private residence back into the school where they were in the Louvre. They, thought they occupy the same space and kind of function quietly while there are leads around and take care around. And that, after the Vie is basically banished, they start running the academy again, just like they did before the Vie was there. So remember that when they called the uh, in the late 60s, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, graffiti everywhere. Graffiti everywhere, there's waters and little tumors in the space. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, so do you think there is a reason to do that going on? There is. I mean, right now there are, there are people who are it's there are people who are, are looking to get rid of computer programs as the basis for, for architectural education and trying to get back to uh, and, and getting rid of not not trying to get rid of modern materials, but trying to figure out, okay, how do we build buildings that are sustainable, but do it with materials that will last longer than modern materials sometimes do? This is the kind of, I mean, I know I'm not in my comfortable territory by having that kind of discussion, but it is, it, they're, they're talking about weight bearing stone buildings again, talking about how do we go back to these principles. And they're, they're, the conversation is almost entirely absent style. They almost start off the conversation by saying, you know, we're not interested in style of the old regime. We're interested in the practical lessons of stone bearing buildings because it's environmentally a better choice than plastic and glass buildings. And that is the kind of debate you're seeing in France happen at the, at the moment. So it'll be interesting to see what happens to an Ecole that is absence, absent a discussion on style, which was often seen as inseparable Yeah, it does seem certainly different. Because right now it's, okay, we've got a practical basis. Let's bring in some of the philosophy, but not too much of it. Don't bring, don't bring in your, your canonical views of beauty and proportion. Um, that's kind of what, what the debate is right now. And then you have people like Richard Sennett, who's written great books on craft. And uh, he's English, but he's involved in this debate. And, um, and uh, traditional techniques. And he calls the place of a birthday cake that's crumbling under the weight of its of its of its ostentatiousness, right? And so he hates the style that comes from it, but he's trying to can't champion the guild worker of the medieval age and their practical skills. In some of these debates, I mean, it's just it's funny how I mean, they're sick with it, right? Absolutely sick with it. Yeah. What kind of influence does Filet Le Duc have on the Academy at that period of time? Viole Le Duc. Well, it's interesting. Viollet Le Duc helps build one of the central pavilions within the academy that's used by the students as kind of a, uh, of, a, of, a of a commissary where they eat. He builds it. I think it, he, he's behind the, the building of it in 1860, and it wasn't until 1863 that students were allowed to incorporate um, iron or steel in their plans of drawings. So they were, they were literally in a school that was using s steel and, and iron as part of the building, but they weren't allowed to emulate it. And Viollet le Duc is kind of the person who, who says to everyone, look, you can still be classical in your approach to things, but you can use modern materials. And um, I think the Notre Dame and the rebuild and the, and the restoration of Notre Dame really 
it gets his name out there as somebody who's, and philosophically, he and AWN Fugin, who's the one who does the Houses of Parliament in the UK, um, they are, there, and, and then you get Ruskin, who's involved, and the French admire what, what's going on in England, and they, un, they admire Ruskin, and they say, oh, it's kind of like, it's kind of like sometimes we don't appreciate it until somebody else appreciates it. They didn't really understand Fugin until the English thought that you understand Fugin. And, and they get their own um, bearings around him, not until like the last quarter. And he's, he's already done most of his work at that point. And then there's a Gothic revival that happens. So it's, it's a complicated question. What does Pugin have to do with all of this? It would have been interesting to see the Garnier Palace if he had won. He was the second place, right? What would have happened if that Garnier Palace was a Gothic revival building? You know, it would have been a very different building than, than the one we see today. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. I wonder, I'm sure there are people who have written PhDs on that topic. But what if Fusion and one, right? Other questions? Well, thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure.